Welcome to Conversations Live. For more than a decade, we've brought you the best in books, entertainment, celebrity interviews, and current events. When the movers and shakers of the world have something to say to you, they say it to us first. Here's your host, Cyrus Webb. And welcome back, everyone, to Conversations Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again, both for our radio audience here in Mississippi at WYAD 94.1 FM and WYADonline.com. We're glad that you all could be with us. Also, just joining us for online affiliates around the world, we're glad you all could be with us as well. Well, when it comes to media, television, and film, is it possible that we could be doing more harm than good when it comes to very important topics and causes that are out there? Our next guest is a co-author of a book that is really fascinating that looks at a very particular issue, but also shows the role that all of us can play in it. We're excited to welcome Andrea L. Press to our program. She's the co-author of the book Media Ready Feminism and Everyday Sexism, How U.S. Audiences Create Meaning Across Platforms. We'll talk to Andrea not only about the writing of this book, but also the research and interviews she did. We'll talk a bit about that and what she hopes you as readers are able to know, not only about the role of media, but also about portrayals and how they can impact how we see ourselves and others as well. If you guys are just now hearing about the book, of course we'll let you know how to get your own copy of it, as well as how you can stay connected with Andrea and the work that she's doing. Andrea, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So, Andrew, this is a really interesting topic. I, I read this book with a lot of interest, and I was fascinated by a lot of what, what was in it. And we're going to get to the interviews, but I thought was really fascinating. But I want to talk about for you, and now that the book is out, what has it been like for you to see the way that people are responding to it? Well, we're uh, very heartened to see that there is a lot of interest in this topic right now. We feel it's a very important topic and that affects the lives of many, many people in our society. And so uh, it's urgent that people take an interest, especially now as some of women's rights are being rolled back. I think growing awareness of the need for attention to gender equality and the rights of women is very important. Well, as you know, Andrea, our show is um, based here on the radio side here in Mississippi. Our state is getting a lot of attention right now to that very topic that you're discussing. I want to, before we get too far into the book, I want to talk about two things about the title. Because, of course, our, our audience, they're familiar with terms like feminism or sexism. What exactly is media-ready feminism? Well, media-ready re- feminism are messages of empowerment that are safe enough for mainstream media. And what we mean by that is that the way feminism is represented in a lot of mainstream media is very partial. It treats the problems of white, upper, and middle-class women and ignores some of the problems that uh, poor women and women of color face, which, of course, can be much greater in their lives. And that's what we mean by media-ready feminism, packaging feminist issues in a way that we call media-ready because media more often emphasize the problems and issues that white middle-class women face. And I think that is what really intrigued me about the book because I said, you know, especially when it comes to media, there's a lot of attention and scrutiny, rightly so, I think, on media coverage. But I think a lot of times we don't think about so much, Andrea, about the roles of television and film and what they are saying or want to say or portray. Uh, in the chapter, um, Prude, Sluts, and Sex, one of the things that you all discuss uh, is television, namely reality television, in Jersey Shore. I want to read a bit of what you said there because I think it's an interesting thing for us to discuss in relation to this topic. You wrote, in distinct contrast to reality television shows that present middle-class status as something to aspire to and also prescribe the makeovers or alterations necessary to achieve it, Jersey Shore was not about self-improvement. On the contrary, the show's conspicuous absence of discussion about how these absolutely non-middle-class characters might get their act together and achieve more middle-class jobs, clothing habits, bodies, and goal-directed everyday lives created an aura of escapism rather than reformation. 
I want to talk about that because it is interesting that typically we do like to see people change. We like to see makeovers, as, as you alluded to there. But there are some shows, like the one you mentioned, that you're sure that was not about that at all. What I mean, in, in writing this book and like really diving into that, what did you see about the attraction about Jersey Shore and what it said about the messages it was sending? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Thank you for reading the book so carefully. Uh, we are sociologists, my co-author, Francesca Tripodi and I, and so we are interested in what people like what is popular in the media. And we were fascinated by the popularity of Jersey Shore. And I did interviews on a college campus, which was largely middle class. And I really felt that the appeal of this show was that it represented a way of life that was very escapist for these middle-class college students who felt very pressured to achieve in a world that consistently makes achievement more and more difficult. And um, they needed escape. And the characters on Jersey Shore were representing a set of values where achievement was not primary. It was not front and center as it had been in the lives of these middle-class college students for all of their lives. And so they really enjoyed that, made the show popular. And that's what I think is is so interesting about this topic when we're talking about media-ready feminism, Andrea, because I think, again, you know, we, we want to think that there are what are perceived as, you know, good examples or or examples of what individuals aspire to be or become. But as you talk about in the book, that's not always the case. And what is so interesting, too, and I thought this was – I did not think about this going into the book, but I, I love the fact that you brought in – this is something that is not just just with, I mean, race. We're talking about even with ageism as well. Did that surprise you, or did was that something going in you knew – that you know, even as you look at an example like in the chapter balancing work and family, uh, using the, the clip there from Dexter Housewives, that that ageism, I mean, was also one of those things that was going to come up when it comes to this issue of media ready feminism and sexism. Well, um, as a media scholar, which I have been for most of my adult life, uh, I do know that the media represents younger women much more often than older women and hypersexualizes them. So I was not surprised to find that representation favored younger women over older women. What was surprising in that chapter was the way women drew on their experience to gain insight into the issue of uh, how difficult attaining work family balance is for many working mothers. So what concerned us when we did the research for that chapter was that younger women felt there was no remaining feminist activism necessary to help the dilemmas working mothers feel, but older women thought differently because they drew from their own experience having been working mothers to see that the support for working mothers is simply not there in our society that people need flex time at work, that they need uh, jobs that recognize the demands of family, they need reliable daycare, and none of it was in place during their working lives. And I think, again, that is the, the big thing. And I think, too, what I love, too, that you mentioned about how shows can can – not only, of course, reflect society, but unfortunately try to change what might be reality, is even talking about examples of how sometimes um, certain things are denied when it comes to inequities, uh, like we saw what you mentioned in that chapter that I referenced from Desperate Housewives about you know a, a man being offered $50,000, where, where their woman, her counteroffer was $5,000. And and even how you know some, even when it comes to younger individuals, you know, not seeing how these, you know, inequalities 
Kemper says, even going into the home. I, I want to talk about as far as the, the audience goes since the book's release. I'm curious, have you noticed that there is an age difference, uh, Andrea, as to how, how people are, are taking to the book? Yes, I do think there's an age difference. I think that um, some, well, I, I'm not sure I would say it affects how people are taking to the book. I think it affects okay. which chapters people find most interesting. Oh, oh, so the chapter yes. about the double standard in uh, sexuality, that's something sexually active women might take to. Uh, I'm not going to say only younger women are sexually active, but younger women are more likely to be dating than older women. Um, the Wikipedia chapter seems to appeal across age groups because we show gender bias in the way women's achievements are represented. And that's of concern. That seems to be of equal concern to everybody. The work family balance chapter, that really appeals to mature women who are mothers and workers and have grappled with that issue of work-family balance. And, of course, Game of Thrones, I think, did have a younger fan base, and that chapter has been more interesting to young women. Does it surprise you, Andrea, considering when you think about the research you've done even before this book, does it surprise you that we seem to be having to have the same conversations <laughs> that we have had years ago? Does it, does it surprise you we're not further alone or more advanced as we think we are? Well, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not sure it surprises me. And I have to say that as someone who was a member of one of the first activist groups treating the issue of sexual harassment, which was organized in 1978, that witnessing the Me Too movement was a wonderful moment for me, even though it took decades to the point where sexual harassment was a massive cultural collective conversation. I still feel that that is immense progress, even though it is very slow. So I'm actually very heartened to see social change in my lifetime. And I believe that we will continue to make progress on these issues that affect women's lives, but progress is very slow. Social change does not happen overnight, and it uh, results from the intensive labor of concerned citizens. And that is what we hope to inspire with this study. I think you know, as as we are reading a book like this and having conversations like this, they definitely um, are important. Uh, you know, and I and I keep wanting to put uh, my industry in this as well, Andrea, because I think there is a responsibility as to. I think a lot of times we think about media coverage, right, and the way things are covered and how some things are sensationalized. Uh, unfortunately, to get a click or a view uh, without really having the substance that it sometimes needs and the and really the conversations it needs to have. What do you hope the media does in in helping to to elevate the conversation uh, when it comes to sexism, but also what you're discussing in the book when it comes to media ready feminism? Well, that is a great question. I'm really glad you asked it because I think the media, uh, those who create media, those who are on air, those who are behind the scenes, really need to read our book and educate themselves about the biases in mainstream media coverage and representation of these issues. I mean, people really need to become educated about uh, what working mothers are experiencing, how the du double sexual standards affect women, how hypersexualization of women in the media affect women, how underrepresentation on Wikipedia is now affecting a whole new generation of women students who are reading about who is notable in our culture. And it's it, once people are educated, they will not replicate the same mistakes when they create media content, and that is the responsibility of those who create media. Yeah. 
You mentioned Wikipedia a couple of times, and I have to say I'm a little surprised that it still has the weight that it does <laughs> in, in many respects. But there is a, a word that was used in that chapter that I thought was was really interesting, and I think it goes to a bigger point that that Francesca and you bring up, and that is credibility. And, and I think mm-hmm. it is one of those things that we definitely have to think more about. I mean, it's one thing to have information, but the credibility behind it. Is that also something that you hope comes from this, Andrea, is that there are more – people who are are looking for outlets and making sure that, and holding outlets accountable quite frankly and whether they're online print you know digital however they might be making sure that they are credible and being fair well yeah there is a a uh, substantial and growing body of research about gender bias on wikipedia we were somewhat shocked to find that as well and um, that makes the online encyclopedia less than credible. It should not have this systematic bias underlying its representations. And those who organize it and run it and reproduce it need to take responsibility for these systematic biases and eradicate them. There is no excuse for them. And, you know, When you teach students, as I have been doing for decades, you see how important Wikipedia has become as a source of information. And so it is influential. And those biases will be reproduced in uh, our students who are relying on this encyclopedia for access to uh, knowledge and wisdom in our society, and it's not giving them knowledge and wisdom; it's giving them bias. You know, you 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 say in the conclusion of the book, Andrea, that we live in a world of participatory media. Talk to us about that, and and what you hope by the time readers finish the book, they realize their role in this. Well, readers do have a role because um, all of these representations we've discussed in the book, television, Wikipedia, we also talked about Tinder and dating apps and online dating, these are all, uh, these all have um, the capacity to process and hear reader responses and user responses. And they are concerned about being popular with their audiences. They're concerned that audiences think well of them and continue to use them. And I think if people express their thoughts about uh, bias against women, that has an impact. And that is what is different about the current media environment from uh, 50 years ago, that it's much easier to register viewer, reader, user uh, criticisms and um, the need for change can come from users, viewers, readers, and hopefully will. So hopefully you will read our book too and communicate its insights and your own thoughts to those who run the media that you use. Yeah. It's a great conversation, Andrea. So glad that we had you here to talk to us about it. Again, everyone, Andrea L. Press has been our guest. She's the co-author of the book, Media Ready Feminism and Everyday Sexism, How U.S. Audiences Create Meaning Across Platforms. We've been discussing the book here. It's available through our friends at Amazon.com. It's published by State University of New York Press. You all can visit their website at sunnypress.edu. And, and Andrea, what about you? How can our audience stay connected with you? Oh, I am easily available. I am the chairman of the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia, and I'm happy to have any emails directed at me, apress at virginia.edu, or look me up on their website. I would love to get readers' responses to our book. All right. Well, Andrea, thank you so much again for the time. Please uh, give our best to Francesca and tell her we really appreciate you all writing this book, doing the research, and having this conversation, and looking forward to having you back on the program again. 
Thank you so much. Hey, you're more than welcome. Thank you. And we thank your audience for tuning in to another great segment of Conversations Live, part of our news you can use here at WYAD 94.1 FM and WYADonline.com here based in Mississippi, as well as our online affiliates. We appreciate you all joining us as well. Until next time, I'm your host, Cyrus Webb, saying as always, enjoy your day, enjoy your life, enjoy your world. Thank you all for choosing Conversations Live. Now let's go make today amazing. Take care. <music> 